And we're live. Welcome back, everyone, to a new episode of the Wheelie Podcast. I'm Micah Toll, your host, and I'm joined again this week by Electrex publisher Seth Weintraub. How's it going, Seth? I'm good. Awesome. So we've got a bunch of e-bike and other e-mobility stories this week. Some of the topics we'll be covering are Archimoto's new three-wheeled leaning electric bike. There's a new um, battery range extender from Priority that doubles e-bikes range. There's a couple of new stealthy electric bikes that are just coming out that don't even look electric. Let's see what else. We've got uh, a couple interesting mid-drive motors that have some neat features we haven't seen before. And we've got a review of the Tesla CyberQuad. Well, the CyberQuad for kids. So uh, <laughs> which one of these stories is first, Seth? Yeah, we should uh, we should just like uh, shorten that, just cyber CyberQuad. All right, so <laughs> the first one is Arkimoto. Um, they are unveiling an, a radical three-wheel drive electric leaning trike that thinks it can beat e-bikes. And we know Arkimoto from uh, their FUVs. Maybe you can talk a little bit about how that uh, translates to this thing. Yeah, definitely. So uh, Arkimoto, they're based in Eugene, Oregon. So it's an American company that's famous for building those FUVs, which stands for Fun Utility Vehicle. And they're three-wheeled, 75-mile-an-hour electric sort of not cars. You know, they sort of look like a car, except that they're uh, motor class uh, or motorcycle class vehicles. So they're basically experts in three-wheeled electric vehicles. And this is the first time they've built something that's more in the micro-mobility sphere. So it's about the size of an electric bike, but it's still a three-wheeler. And unlike their FUVs, which are rigid, um, despite the, the full suspension, these are actually leaning trikes. They call it the MLM. And it's a, a really cool concept because it combines suspension, it combines uh, three wheelers and this leaning concept. So it's a lot more stable than an electric bicycle because when you go into turns, you lean like a bike, but when you come to a stop, it can't fall over, it's a three wheeler. In addition to the uh, full suspension leaning setup, it's also drive by wire, which is really neat. So there's no chain, there's no belt, there's, uh, I guess, no mechanical connection at all between the pedals and the motors. Instead, there are actually three hub motors. There's a motor in each of the three wheels, and there's a generator at the pedals. So oh, wow. as you pedal the thing, you're basically creating elect uh, electricity that gets transferred by wire to the uh, to the motors. And there's, of course, a battery to store that energy. And it seems like there's a throttle as well, though this is a prototype, so it's hard to say exactly what's going to be included on it. But it's you know a lot of interesting new concepts, three-wheeler, leaning, drive-by-wire. There's a, a lot to take in. I mean, have you, have you ever seen anything like this, Seth? No, I don't think so. And, and looking at the like geometry, I'm trying to imagine how it's kind of like a lean back kind of experience it, it feels like um, yeah there's um there's a video there if you scroll down you can see they've got one prototype it looks like and they've got a guy uh test riding it around and it seems like you can really lean into those corners there i mean it's a a pretty neat looking concept they worked with um um another company that they actually acquired about a year ago to design the tilting setup i think it's tilting motor works that they uh, bought that company so mm -hmm. this is the first vehicle that we're actually seeing them employ that new technology on. Obviously, you know, tilting three wheelers are not new, but they've got their own sort of design for that tilting suspension. And it, it really seems to work quite well. And, you know, what they're pitching is that increased stability over e-bikes. Yeah. Watching this guy uh, ride this around, it looks a lot easier. It looks like he's got a longer saddle than the uh, traditional bike seat that, um, that the uh, earlier image had. Yeah, so they've uh, talked about making this a two-seater. Um, so oh, I guess you'd have, you know, like a, a pillion rider back there that could ride with you. That That's probably going to feel interesting in the turns when you lean real hard with a passenger back there. Yeah, and this doesn't feel like the type of three-wheeler or tricycle that, you know, is for old people. It's, it's more like a performance uh, trike. Would yeah, you say that or, or is this one of those both things? I mean, it seems like a sportier type of vehicle. I'm sure that, you know, they'll still pitch it for, you know, older people that maybe want to feel more stable at a stop because that will be one of the big advantages that, you know, you can't really fall off of it. You don't even have to put your feet down. 
but I think it's, it really looks pretty sporty. So it doesn't seem like they're just going for like an accessibility thing. It looks like it's really meant to be, you know, fun and, and thrilling as well. Yeah. And also you mentioned the pedal by wire. Um, this is, I think we've seen a few others. We saw it at uh, IAA in Berlin. We saw a pedal by wire. Is this, <clears throat> is this like a new trend you think? Yeah. I mean, it's, it's a complicated system. And so I think that's why we haven't seen too many people attempt it yet. It's kind of like, if it's not broke, don't fix right. it. But uh, we are surprisingly starting to see more of these um, sort of pedal by wire systems coming out there. I mean, there are some advantages to it, especially when you've got three motors like this, it mm -hmm. really means you can sync them all up and you're not tied to a, you know, a chain drive or a belt drive. And it creates more freedom when you're designing the actual frame but it's certainly more complicated and I imagine it's going to add to the cost. So I'm a little bit worried about what the cost of this is going to be because yeah. that's really going to make or break it. Right. Right. So well, you know, we don't know looks, yet. Yeah. Sorry, it, certainly looks like a, it certainly looks like a fun vehicle. Um, do you have any idea when this will be a like a real product? They're saying quarter four of this year. So I assume that means December 31st is the day they'll roll it out because that's a lot to finish designing by the end right. of this year. That's that's usually when quarter four things come out. All right. Well, that, that seems pretty cool. I uh, kind of look forward to uh, seeing more about that. Um, the next uh, story is uh, doubling e-bike range, priority introducing a new add-on battery bumping electric bike capacity. Great idea. Tell us about this. So yeah, this is a um, basically a second doubling battery that Priority's created that's designed for the Priority current bike. Uh, it's actually a bike that I have. It's right here behind me. And uh, it's a really awesome e-bike. It's like my go-to sort of fitness bike because it's a really nice setup, belt drive, continuously variable transmission, hydraulic brakes, mid-drive. So there's a lot to like there. But for a lot of people that want to be able to go further than the 500 watt hour battery will allow, they've created this setup and it's just like a plug and play thing. So anyone can install it themselves. You basically just uh, bolt that rack onto the back of the bike and it's a double layer rack. So you're not only getting an extra battery, you're getting a, a rack that you can actually hang panniers on and that sort of thing. And then the second battery just slips right in there and you've always got it there piggybacking on top of your um, the battery you have there. And so they've actually had to design a controller to uh, sort of smartly choose between the two batteries and, and choose which one's going to be used. And as I understand it, they're uh, using a voltage-based system so that the higher voltage battery is the one that's going to get drained. And so it's not just like a simple uh, parallel connection where you'd actually have to make sure that both batteries are at a similar charge when you plug them together. I've you know done that before on some of my e-bikes and it's a common DIY method, but it's a, a quick and dirty method. So what they've done here is a little bit more intelligent and takes a little bit more design chops to, to do it in an elegant way. But it also means that you can easily charge just one of the batteries at a time. And so you can just always leave that one on the back and take the, the middle battery in and, and charge that and save the rear battery for just when you're going further, or you can charge both. Uh, there's just sort of a, a lot of options there. But I know for my bike, I get about 40-ish miles per charge, and I'm keeping it on pretty low pedal assist because, you know, that's the bike I use for fitness. But if you're rocking the 28 miles an hour on the highest pedal assist level, you might only get 20, 25 miles of range. And so to be able to boost that to 40 or 50 miles is something that not a lot of e-bikes can do. So I, I think it's pretty cool that they've come out with this new system. Yeah, it, it, uh, it like how so how how will it work or or can you buy this for uh, other bikes um, out there? Do they have to be the similar voltage, um, etc.? So they've got it set up with the connectors that fit that motor and that battery. Mm -hmm. So I they don't say this, but I'm guessing that you might be able to wire it into other systems if they're also 48 volt and you, you know, chop off the connector and use it um, mm -hmm. with your own connectors. Now I can't guarantee that. And I'm sure that's going to void your warranty. So right. don't go do that and say, Micah said it was all right. But um, I imagine that there would be ways to make it fit other bikes and other motor systems. 
but it is designed to be plug and play with their system. And their system, it's not, it's not an off the shelf thing. It's a, uh, I mean, it kind of looks like a, what is that? Shimano? No. Um, that I believe is a truck run motor. So it's okay. a lesser known brand, but it's a really high torque mid drive motor. And okay. uh, we don't see it that often. There are, I know of like two bikes I can think of off the top of my head that use it, but it's actually a, a really nice motor. It's a little bit where, louder than some I've, I've heard before. Where are they based out of? Truck Run? Uh, it's a Chinese brand, I believe. Chinese, okay. Yeah. Cool. I mean, at this, well, at this point, there's like a dozen motor manufacturers out there. Right. They probably all trade trade secrets and stuff. All right. Yeah, but it's, it's a cool system, though. I like it. I'm planning to get one so I can test out the range and do some, like, really long rides. That's not it behind you, is it? Uh, well, this is the bike, but I don't have the battery yet. Okay. I mean, I don't have the, the extender. Yeah. Okay. Cool. All right, moving forward. Uh, the Fast Stealthy Baby Maker 2. Love the name. Uh, then the uh, model on there as well. Uh, electric bike launched at ultra low price touts usa assembly in detroit yeah so we talked about this a little bit two weeks ago when they first teased that the bike was coming uh, but the baby maker originally was a very stealthy single speed belt drive e-bike that launched on i think it was indiegogo a few years ago they made like 13 million dollars so now they're back it sounds like an 80s movie like back and better than ever so it's uh it's returned with the baby maker 2 and They've upped the battery capacity, so it's, it's still not that big. Now it's at 36 volts and 10 amp hours, where I think it was uh, 7 amp hours or 6 amp hours before. So uh, about 40% more battery, which you know obviously translates into 40% more range. And still a number of good components. Uh, that Gates carbon belt drive, which is a very high-end belt drive. Also Magura hydraulic disc brakes, which is a surprisingly high-end break i'm not sure why they it seems odd to put it on a bike like this because it should be on a much nicer bike um the motor is not terribly large i believe it's a 350 watt motor uh, but it does get up to 25 miles an hour so that little motor is working pretty hard and uh overall it's just like a nice sort of stealthy um low profile bike but the real kicker is the price it has an MSRP of 2200 but they were selling it on the first day with $1,000 off, so it was 1200 bucks. And then now I think it's um, like eight or $900 off, and the, you know, the, the sale's going down each day that they're selling this on, uh, um, on their site. This time, I don't think they did Indiegogo. They're just you know, doing like a, a crowdfunding sort of launch on their own site. But that's, I mean, a, a serious deal for the parts you're getting. Uh, you know that I mean that Gates carbon drive is expensive by itself, let alone those other parts. Yeah, I think they made a lot of uh, really good decisions on uh, what to add and to keep the price low. Obviously, some very high end components, the Gates drive, um, belt drive. The wheels look solid. They didn't try to put on a uh, suspension fork. Um, you know, a lot of times these bikes will have a uh, you know, like a, a low cost suspension fork, which kind of ruins the whole thing. Um, so uh, what what's going on with gearing here? I know Gates doesn't have, um, or, you know, with a belt drive, you don't have the traditional gears. Yeah. So this is a single speed, which for some people, that's going to be a bummer, you know, especially yep. if you're in a hilly area. Though I will say that the times that I've ridden single speed e-bikes on hills, I find that the fact that you've got the motor assist it makes it a big difference between trying to you know, start without motor assistance in that tall gear. So if you've never driven an e-bike in a single speed setup on, in a hilly area, don't like immediately discount it because you might find that you, know, you really get sort of the, the low gear effect from using the motor assistance. And then pretty quickly you're up to a speed where the single speed gearing feels pretty effective it's i mean a lot of people leave their bikes just in the highest gear when they ride an e-bike so it's it's right. kind of like that i don't know about you seth but i know a lot of my bikes just sit in the highest gear all the time yep um and, and that's kind of interesting also they they mentioned 25 miles per hour top speed i imagine you're probably pedaling pretty fast at that rate but that's probably also why they didn't go all the way up to 28 you know class three limit I, i'm sure there's some amount of cadence that's 
comfortable for everyone and at 25 miles per hour with a single speed i i can't imagine uh most people will be comfortable pedaling at that that rate now this has a throttle or doesn't have a throttle no this one does not have a throttle and i think they went that way because the battery is still fairly small at 360 watt hours mm. you could probably get away with the throttle at that point but you'd really be you know hampering that that range a lot of these styles of e-bikes um, you know, there's also the ride one up roadster V2, which is a very similar, uh, type of e-bike. They don't have throttles just because with that small of a battery, you just, you know, burn through it so quickly if you're not helping by pedaling. Right. Small battery, kind of low power motor, much better for pedaling. So that's Definitely. interesting. Um, you know, I, I would like in my experience, like the, uh, rad runner is, I wouldn't say similar. It's a totally different type of bike, but it's similar in that it's a single speed. Maybe the Rad Mission would be another similar type of uh, bike layout. Um, yeah, that'd be a good comparison. Do you think that, well, you know, at, at this price where it is now, where else do you, I mean, like, is this something that's going to be a, I don't want to say like a Rad killer or anything, but is this is this kind of displacing other bikes in, in this this field? Yeah, it's an interesting question because despite the first uh, crowdfunding campaign for the Baby Maker One being so popular, I mean, you know, they raised like 13 million or something. I think that only translated into something like uh, 6,000 bikes. And so, I mean, I think, you know, Rad probably does that in like a weekend. Right. So, you know, I, I don't think unless they're just even more successful this time, which they very well may be. I'm not sure that that the biggest companies are going to be worrying too much. the The big advantage that uh, FLX might have here with the Baby Maker Two is that they're touting what will apparently be U.S. based assembly. They're saying they're going to assemble these in Detroit, and so that could be a big advantage. Though it's it's unclear how much of that assembly will really take place there. You know, how much of this is just sort of you know putting the seat on, putting the handlebars on, that sort of thing, which I, I haven't been able to determine. Yeah. So uh, it's that remains to be seen. And I'd like to, you know, get a little more information from the company about that, because to tell, you know, U.S. assembly is a very big deal. There's almost no companies doing that in the U.S. It's like, you know, electric bike company is the one I can think of that really does U.S. assembly. And so if they're actually going to come in with building these bikes in Detroit, that could be a big deal. Yeah, maybe we can go check out their plan at some point. Definitely. Maybe. I mean, we're, we're obviously in Detroit for the, the electric vehicles quite a bit. So uh, that would be fun. All right. New, i uh, going to have problems with this. In Un, Unoro? It's you, yeah, I think I go Unoro, but, you know, take okay. a stab at it. Unoro, uh, D6 mid-drive electric bike with torque sensor offers entry-level road e-bike. So this is obviously a um, on-street bike. Tell us about it. For sure, yeah. And so this is, it's an interesting one to compare to the Baby Maker 2 because it's also that sort of street sporty type of road bike, though this one leans a lot more into the fitness aspect. However, it's it's got some key differences. So the D6 here, it's got a mid-drive motor, you know, still going to be a, a low power, but it's um, an actual mid-drive motor. That means it's got uh, gearing. I think it's, it's either a 9-speed or an 11-speed. Um, now that I say that, it's probably a 10 speed, but it's got a, a, a cassette back there. Um, the brakes, I'm not sure which company makes the the brakes, but I believe it's got um, hydraulic brakes on there. Uh, and then it comes in a couple of formats. So, you know, they got the drop bar if you're into sort of the, the road biking. They've got the street bars if you're more of a city biker. And it's uh, just another sort of stealthy nicely designed battery integrated e-bike that doesn't scream electric bike you know it looks like a uh, pretty much a typical road bike that you'd see out there on a sunday with some dude in lycra riding around right and so, so this is a sorry go on well i was gonna say like uh class three um does it have any like you know does it go over 28 miles per hour does it have any like neat features like that or is it the low price kind of the neat feature. Yeah, I think that's really it. It's it's bringing sort of um, you know fitness road bikes, especially with a mid drive, to an affordable price point. So it's um, listed at two thousand dollars, but 
when they open the uh, crowdfunding campaign, which it's not actually open yet, probably in the next few weeks, we'll see it. It's going to be discounted to $1,200. So the same oh, price wow. that the baby maker two started at. And yeah, so I mean, mid drive, just a mid drive at $1,200 is already like, wow. But then, you know, integrated battery, um, just a really nice setup for uh, a road bike, which I mean, you, you ride road bikes, you know how expensive those things are. Right. And what do we know? So, um, is the motor like for a road bike, is it powerful for a road bike or kind of, they, they haven't released the the info on the power yet. I assume okay. it's going to be listed at 250 Watts so right. that they can sell it in any country, but the real power I'm guessing is going to be in like the 350, 400 watt range. It definitely doesn't look like a very big motor. There's not a right. lot there. And I can't even tell by looking at it what brand it is. I don't know if you recognize that one, but no. I don't recognize it. Yeah. No, it looks like so a, a, good, a good format though. Yeah, right. I mean, it, it looks the part. And it's interesting because you know, is not known for, you know, high end bikes. They're a sort of a value company. They're not the super budget like Anchier or something, but they're, they're known for making sort of mid tier e-bikes with reasonable prices. So that's sort of what they're doing here. You know, it's not a super cheap bike. It's a mid-level bike, but it comes in with a pretty good price. So we'll have to see if the quality stands up because, you know, road bikers are, they're used to some serious quality. Right. Yeah. If you're going road bike, you're probably going to have a, a really high baseline there. Yeah. So this one, I think it could be interesting. I mean, I'm not um, particularly a, you know, a road biker myself. Mm -hmm. Like I said, the priority current is like my fitness bike and that's very much sort of a city hybrid bike. I'm not a over the bars kind of hunched guy, mm -hmm. though I did recently get a um, electric gravel bike with the Roadster V2 gravel. So I'm starting to get a little more into that sort of like hunched over road bikey type of riding. But this one, it's interesting enough that I, I definitely want to try this and see if you know, that's my jam. Yeah, it was, that was going to be my last question. Is this something that you could kind of upgrade with some uh, bigger wheels and uh, to a, a gravel bike? It's got that look to it. I mean, I, th I think there's probably going to be clearance for some, you know, gravel tires in there. And it's if it's, you know, robust enough. I don't know anything about the construction of that frame. So I don't right, you know, want to strip the thing right. to pieces, <laughs> you know, and have, uh, you know, bosses falling off of it or anything. But assuming it's a well-made frame, then I could definitely see, you know, put some gravel tires on there and having, you know, a fun little electric gravel bike at a fraction of the cost of, you know, something like uh, the Yamaha Wabash, which is a great gravel bike, but I think it's like three and a half, maybe right. close to $4,000. Yeah, I think gravel, just typical bike store gravel bikes are 3500 at the very lowest. Yeah. So, I mean, this would be huge if, if you could get an electric gravel bike for 1200 bucks. Yeah. All right. Uh, moving on. This is kind of my favorite. Uh, Big Tricks XD unveiled as mind-boggling Lee powerful electric bike motor with 300 nanometers of torque. Tell us about yeah, that. Yeah, so this, this one is like, I think mind-boggling is a fair word to use here because this is not only a hugely powerful mid-drive electric bike motor, but they've totally rethought how mid-drive motors work. So to sort of set the stage for this, the most powerful mid-drive electric bike motors right now uh, the biggest retail option is probably the Bafang Ultra, also known as the M620. Um, Seth, you and I have both ridden that motor, and it mm -hmm. is a beast. And in yep. fact, it is, it's so powerful that it often destroys bike parts, like, you know, chains, cassettes. It just, like, it, it eats through this stuff. And so that was the problem that Bike Tricks was trying to solve with this mid-drive. If they were going to go even more powerful, which this thing is, like, twice as powerful as that motor then they had to solve the problem of it just destroying bike parts. And what they did was they actually moved away from using the bicycle's drivetrain altogether. So normally the mid-drive motor would power the crank uh, and the uh, chain ring on the right side of the bike, and that would pass through the chain to the bicycle's cassette on the rear wheel. What they did was they installed an entirely new drive sprocket on the left side of the bike at the pedals, and that's where the motor output goes. Then it gets transferred along a second chain, which is a stronger sort of um, almost a motorcycle level chain. And that is mounted to a sprocket on the rear wheel. And that is a much thicker sprocket, something that can't be you know, just eaten away like a typical bicycle cassette sprocket. 
And so they've actually got two chains and two independent drive systems, essentially two drive trains. The original bicycle drive train is still there, but it doesn't carry any of the electrical power anymore. All of that gets transferred along a second, almost motorcycle level drive train on the other side of the bike. And so they uh, released a video showing the performance of this thing. And it's just incredible. They did a um, introducing the most powerful uh, and drag race between bike we've ever made. the um, uh, M620 model and the uh, new Bike Tricks HD. And I mean, it just blew it away in a drag race. And then they took it to this giant hill and they gave the uh, M620 a huge head start going up the side of this mountain here. And then the guy on the Bike Tricks XD was just waiting until the, to the M620 got about halfway up the hill and then hit the gas and man, he just flew right by that M620. It's, I mean, it's incredible to see the difference in performance between these two motors where the M620 used to be just like the, you know, end all be all of high power electric bike motors. And it looks like a granny motor next to this new thing. That's crazy. Yeah, um, I mean, the, the engineering that went into this is just incredible. They, I mean, my hat's off to, to bike tricks and their, their engineering team because they've developed something awesome here. They're also building it in Canada there where they're located. So it's like, you know, North American designed and North American produced, which is really cool. Yeah. And uh, so they're putting it, we're watching it now on the YouTube, but they're putting it up against the, the juggernaut, as you mentioned. And um, it's not even like they're on a, a drag trip track and it's not even even close it's like a, a tesla versus like a, a pinto almost um, <laughs> yeah it's it's crazy and skip like uh, another 30 seconds or 45 seconds ahead to get to uh -huh. that mountain there yeah and it's i mean it's crazy when you watch they should three bikes they had a guy pedaling that that poor guy just as like <laughs> a control group they had a right. guy pedaling a mountain bike up and then uh, uh, there you can see someone's following up on a, an m620 which again like that was the best motor in the industry. Yeah. And, you know, obviously he's going to be doing better than the guy pedaling, but that's a very steep hill and, you know, for any bicycle. <laughs> and then now you see the XD just like flying past. Yeah. It's like going downhill, but going uphill. It looks yeah. Like. I mean, the power there, they, they call it 2000 plus watts. And I think that plus is hiding a few more thousand watts. Right. So that's, I mean, with the two chains, <clears throat> two chains, two different types of chains, Obviously, you're adding a lot of expense, a lot of complications, a lot more things that can go wrong. How do you think, uh, like, who who is this aimed at? I mean, is this a, a mainstream thing or is this going to be something that only a few people are going to be able to afford and rationalize? Yeah. So um, in terms of, we'll start with expense because, yeah, you got to be able to afford it. So the first bike that's coming out on is they're going to make a Juggernaut XD. And it's going to be a $6,000 bike, uh, though it's marked down $1,000 uh, for pre-orders. So you're looking at a $5,000 bike that comes with that setup. Uh, by the way, here they towed a camper trailer with the yeah, thing. Yeah, no big deal. Just <laughs> no big towing, deal. It, and it towing it uphill as well. <laughs> yeah, so um, you know, obviously going to be expensive, but I don't think that this is going to be a um, you know a mainstream motor choice. It's I think really going to be for. Uh, people that want to ride off-road and specifically want to do some some pretty crazy terrain like that sort of mountain you saw them climbing up. And so it's really going to be sort of a, a specialty motor for that, not something you'd install on a, a commuter bike or something you'd use every day. And uh, and even then, though, like there was a discussion in the comments about, um, you know, whether you can actually use this like a bicycle and whether, you know, we're looking at a motorcycle here. And I, I think that I would still say that this is, uh, certainly capable of doing like e-bike fitness style riding. And the way I would compare it, it's like, you know, I have a Suron and it's, it's fun to go out there and ride it and, you know, like do dirt bike style riding, but I don't feel like I'm on a, an electric bike at that point. You know, like I feel like I'm riding a dirt bike and when I'm on an electric bike and I'm pedaling, I feel like I'm part of the process, you know, like I'm part of the machine. And even when you have a high power e-bike motor like this, you still feel like you're part of the equation. You know, maybe you're adding your 250 watts or whatever to right. its 2000 watts, but it's just like you'd be adding your 250 watts to another 250 watt e-bike. You're still doing the same amount of work. It's just doing a lot more along with you. So it's still a, a really awesome sort of pedaling experience. That's the way I would put it at least. <clears throat> and you can ca carry a, a, tr a trailer as well. So that's a nice bonus. <laughs> 
yeah, you can take the family camping with it. <laughs> yeah, I kind of, you know, like I, I can't get over the uh, the complexity of the chains, though. Um, I, I wonder why they didn't just go with one burly chain instead of the two different chains. Well, the one thing I'll say there is that I think it, it does preserve the redundancy. So the nice thing with the hub motor, right, is that if something in your hub motor right. breaks, you can pedal home. And if you know your chain breaks, you have a hub motor to get home. So mm -hmm. this way, because they're two independent drive systems, if one mm -hmm. of them fails, you do have the other one. That's true. But um, you know, also because that motorcycle chain is so heavy, I don't think you'd be able to have a typical derailer. You know, like you're kind right. of set with that sprocket. So right. it's, it certainly does add, you know, adds complexity. It adds weight. It adds expense. It adds a lot of stuff. But if if you're someone who's looking for that crazy two thousand plus watts, this is the way to do it without destroying your bike. Yeah, and you know, the drivetrain looks burly, but like. You know what is the brake system like? What is the uh, the even that wheel looks like a typical fat tire wheel? Is you know have have those things been updated as well? That's a good question. Yeah, it's something to certainly look into because uh, this is I I would say it's like riding down a giant hill a hundred percent of the time when you've got that much power. So you, right. you know you want to make sure your components are capable of that, and you know you've got good probably four piston brakes would be necessary at that point. That sort of thing, double wall yeah. rims. So that's a that's a good question. Something to look into is, you know, how overbuilt is the rest of the bike, or is it just a super high power motor and the rest is going to fall apart? Yeah, I mean, so it says two hundred twenty uh, millimeter rear disc brakes, probably similar on the front. Um, we saw a company called Delfast um, actually put two sets of disc brakes on the front of their uh, high powered bikes. I wonder if that's something they're thinking about here as well. Yeah, potentially. Though the Delfast goes like 50 miles an hour. I'm not right. sure what the high speed is here. Um, I'm not sure that, you know, they're designing this to go 50 like that. I mean, the Delfast really is a motorcycle. You know, right. it's, this is still borderline. I mean, this is a, I would call this a high power electric bike. Even though it's a 2000 watts, it's still designed to be, you know, comfortable to pedal. It's got the right geometry. It's, it's a bike with a high power motor as opposed to Delfast, which is a motorcycle with pedals. Yeah, that's true. All right, moving on. Uh, new electric uh, bike, mid drive motor with built in automatic transmission ready for production. So, yeah, this is a, um, I call it new. It was actually unveiled a little over a year ago by Vallejo. I hope I'm saying that right. It's a French company. And the idea here is that the transmission and the motor are all combined at the pedals there. So it's a bit chunkier than what you think of, of you know, like a typical mid-drive motor, like you see a Bosch motor on an e-bike. That's because it's hiding an automatic transmission in there. So they worked with a company called Effigier, which I believe is also another French company that does transmission designs. So they teamed up and they designed that automatic transmission and it puts it all in there um, basically centered in the bike. So you get that nice, um, both the low center of gravity and all the weight is, is right in the middle of the bike, which probably helps on the trails when you're, you know, flicking that thing around that it's, you don't have a large moment with a lot more weight out of the end of the bike. Like you typically would with a derailleur setup. And it also allows a, uh, belt drive where with a normal belt drive e-bike, either you're going to have a internally geared hub to shift gears, or you're going to end up with a single speed like we saw on the baby maker too, because there's just no way to shift gears with a belt, or at least no one has developed one yet. And so you well, have the internal geared hub. Yeah. They have the internal geared hub. Right. So, so you, even then though, you've, you know, you still got your transmission out in the back wheel. Right. So the whole idea here is that you have it centered in the bike. So it's probably also another complicated solution, but it looks like a pretty neat setup and it could do interesting things for the bike's handling getting that weight even closer to the center of the bike. Yeah. So the sprocket isn't tied directly to the, uh, the pedals, right? It's, it's going to vary depending on the, the gearing. Right. And so I think that's also why when you see that picture there, it's like a really small chain ring and then, you know, like a big sprocket, basically they're the same size, which you almost never see. And so um, you've got that internal automatic transmission in there. That's really doing all the work for shifting gears. 
it's automatic. And sometimes these things can be a little, um, you know, finicky, these automatic transmissions, or they shift when the human wouldn't normally shift. So it'll be interesting to determine uh, how well it actually works, how good the predictive shifting is in the automatic transmission. But in terms of sort of the, the engineering and, and the weight balance, it certainly has some advantages. It just comes down to how well it works and, and what their um, sort of profile is for deciding when these automatic shifts occur. And is that a throttle uh, option we're seeing here? I know when the, the sprocket isn't tied to the pedal, you have, you know, like in a lot of Bafang mid drives, you have a throttle on a mid drive, which is, you know, immediately you're like, what? But <laughs> because the it isn't tied to the pedal, you can see the sprocket, the front sprocket going when you're not pedaling. Is this also an option with this? It's a good question. I don't see a throttle in the images there. It it could be something they could add because you're right. You know, it's you could definitely do that, and you get that sort of trippy thing where the sprocket's turning but the pedals aren't. Right. But because this is a French company, I don't see them at least doing it initially because they're going to have to conform to European Union bike laws and. As we all know, unfortunately, Europeans don't get to enjoy throttles the way you do in uh, some of the rest of the world. At least not so, legally. Yeah, not legally. <laughs> so um, they're probably not going to come out, at least on the first version, with a throttle. Though it would mm -hmm. be great if they have you know, like a, a plug-and-play throttle that they could send to a U.S. customer. You know, If you were to buy one and it's legal where you live, then you could just plug it in because that would be great especially with that automatic transmission. Oh man, that'd be fun. And you could have a gear sensor in there and everything. That could be yeah. a nice setup. Yeah, that'd be nice. All right. Well, we'll, we'll look forward to hearing more about this. Um, and then finally, uh, the, the Tesla CyberQuad for kids. Uh, review. Yeah, so... Mini electric ATV, that's so much fun. You stole it from your poor nephews. <laughs> so this is... Uh... This is a blast. So a little backstory here. Obviously, you know, I think most people know about the Tesla CyberQuad. When Tesla unveiled the Cybertruck back in, what was that, end of 2019, um, like they, they also unveiled the CyberQuad, which is a smaller electric ATV. And uh, it was sort of like a, you know, one more thing at the end of the big unveiling for the Cybertruck. It was this really awesome looking ATV. It sort of had the Cybertrucks polygonal angular design but it's been two and a half years or something and there's still no uh, estimated date for when the cyber quad is going to be released but or even that didn't stop truck. <laughs> yeah there you go <laughs> that matter. And, and yeah and i think the truck's gonna come a long time before the quad but that didn't stop a uh, radio flyer from saying hey we can build something like this so they teamed up with tesla and they've worked together before they've made like a kid's um Model S, I believe, and, mm -hmm. and a couple of Tesla themed products. So Radio Flyer with Tesla designed a kid's version of the CyberQuad. And if you're thinking like, oh, you know, it's one of those like power wheels that you get at Walmart and it's got like a little lantern battery in it, it's a lot more powerful than that. So I got to test out one of these and uh, it was, you know, I, mostly I was meant to, you know, let my... Uh, nephews ride it around, they're eight and 10, but really I did most of the testing and this thing can move an adult. It's got a 150 pound weight limit. I'm a bit over that, but man, this thing moves with me on it. It's now keep in mind, it's only rated for 10 miles an hour. There's two speeds, five and 10 miles an hour, but you'll never use the five mile an hour speed. Right. But even, even with a, you know, over the weight limit adult on it, it still moves at its top speed. So, you know, it's really uh, a high powered device. It's the motor says 500 Watts. I could see it putting out a little bit more, especially if, you know, that's the continuous rating. And, uh, it's just a really neatly designed, uh, little kids ATV. It's got a, a removable battery, lithium ion. So it's, you know, not one of these lead acid kids toys. It's got rear suspension. It's a solid axle. So the whole, you know, rear axle moves together. Um, there's no suspension in the front, but it's got uh, Ackerman steering. I mean, you know, disc brakes, the whole thing's really pretty nicely designed for a kid's toy. And the fact that it can move an adult means, you know, it's over-engineered for kids for sure. But, uh, I mean, this thing is just, it's a hoot. Like, I mean, it looks great, doesn't it? Like, yeah, I, w I wonder if this is possible, like, will mall cops be asking for these instead of their segues? 
Like, is this possible that there's a com commercial use for this or is this only a toy? I mean, I could see it. It's also got good range. Like, that's the thing. It didn't feel like a toy at all when I was using it. Like, when you put kids on it, it looks like a toy. But the fact that, like, I could ride around, I was riding it around on roads. Like, you know, it's probably not street legal, but, you know, going around the neighborhood and stuff. Like, you know, I was stopping at stop signs. Cars were letting me go. Like, this thing was like a small transportation device, not just mm -hmm. a kid's toy. I could certainly see, you know, people using it for that kind of utility work. It's, I mean, it's got power, it's got range. It's got a range of 15 miles. Isn't that right. crazy? That's a lot of mall laps. For, yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, that, that lasts all day. Right. Um, that, so that's interesting. Uh, price though, it's not like, uh, one of the, the Walmart things either. A uh, little, yeah. Little price here. Yeah. I think you could get like seven or eight of those Walmart, uh, $250 power wheels for one of these $2,000, uh tesla cyber quad for kids it's a bit pricey though you'll it might be nice to hear that you won't actually have to pay two thousand dollars because you can't actually buy one they're sold out for like probably a long long time they sold out right. basically so immediately so you'll probably be able to buy one on ebay in a few months for like four grand Something yeah they're crazy. actually listed on on ebay i looked it up and yeah they're like there are people selling them for like three four grand it's it's nuts it's not surprising at all um, yeah. yeah, I mean, that looks like a super fun toy. Like I kind of feel like I grew up in the wrong era. Uh, right. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I, I'm just amazed how powerful it is. I wonder, I mean, the original Cybertruck release date was right around now or a few months ago, actually. Um, I wonder if, you know, at the outset, Radio Flyer was like, all right, when is this released? All right, we're going to make it for the release date. And then, of course, Tesla pushed it back a few times, and we don't even know when they're due now. But, um, you know, Radio Flyer <laughs> probably has, like, a, you know, a more uh, reliable process of, you know, designing and putting something together and, and building something. This is obviously much more complicated than the Cyber Quad or even the Cyber, cyber Truck as well. So I wonder if that was it was originally supposed to be released alongside the, uh, the, tr the truck and the quad. They really did, yeah. uh, you know, we're looking at the video right now. They really did kind of like do the, go the extra mile with like the charger that looks like the cyber quad and, and all the little nuances like the lighting and stuff. Yeah, I mean, they really paid homage so well to the original cyber quad, which you really only have like a few minutes of video footage and a couple of photos to yeah. sort of base it on. And I'm, you know, I'm really impressed with how well they did. It makes you wonder why. Tesla doesn't produce the cyber quad first. Cause I almost feel like that would be a lot less work than the, the truck. Yeah. I mean, it, and it sounds like they're so, still serious about making it. Um, we saw a video recently with uh, Franz, uh, the Tesla designer and his kids where he was on a cyber quad, like a real one. And his kids were on this one and you know, so it's still happening and they're still in development, but um, it doesn't seem like uh, we're going to hear from Tesla, you know, look at get a look at Tesla's version anytime soon. Yeah, I almost wonder if, you know, once they actually produce the cyber quad, it opens up, you know, that they're actually producing things other than cars. Because I know having kicked around the idea of an electric dirt bike before um, right. it goes shortly after the uh, cyber truck reveal. I know that Elon is very anti Tesla motorcycle because he had a bad motorcycle experience uh, in his youth, but they've, they've actually talked about dirt bikes. And so if they make a cyber quad, then it seems like they have to start following up with non car things. Yeah, it would, it would be really cool to see them uh, get into mobility, uh, you know, smaller mobility items, not maybe not a scooter, but you know, something in, in that realm. Yeah, when are we going to get the bike? I mean, that seems like the simple, like that's low hanging fruit, right? It's so right. easy to build a bike compared to a car. Yeah. And, you know, they have the motor capability, they have the battery capability, obviously, and that's 90% of the, the game. Um, yeah, it's, it's like really, they could knock that out in a month. Right. It could be like, you know, instead of doing a submarine to rescue Thai kids, Elon could be like, all right, build a bike, come back and come back in a week with the uh, prototype. And they could honestly do that with their capabilities. 
Yeah, it just it seems like such a missed opportunity. I really thought that when the e-bike market just skyrocketed in the last year, 18 months, that that might be the point that Tesla was like, you know, this is an easy area for us to expand into and actually, you know, move the market forward and 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 move the industry forward in a meaningful way. But I mean, it doesn't even sound like there's even a hint of interest in a in an e-bike other than a comment that he made like two and a half years ago, I think once. Yeah. It was like on a Kara Swisher podcast and yeah, and just he was like an offhand. Right. And it wasn't even like we're doing it. It was like, we could do one or I would be okay with doing one. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, I don't think anyone should, should bet on a Tesla electric bike anytime soon, but it just seems like such a missed opportunity for them. Yeah. All right, so we have a few comments um, in the comments. If you guys are still listening, uh, please uh, throw a comment in if you have anything to, to add or any questions. Um, so we got a lot of comments, but not a lot of um, questions, I would say. Um, so let's jump in here. Um, Galen Thurber asks, um, are RADs still back ordered? I think they've got pretty much everything in stock at this point. I don't, I don't think there's much back order there anymore. Yeah. And in fact, um, uh, you posted today, there's a, a sale on a specific, um, rad runners. Is that, is that right? So the rad, rad runner, runner and the, um, uh, rad Rover six plus. So their highest end bike, um, they, both of them, they dropped the price 200. Yeah. So not only do they have bikes in stock, but they're able to lower prices, which is, an indication that, you know, they're not, um, you know, struggling to, to meet supply kind of thing. So what does that bring down the rad? Cause I know they hiked the price on the rad runner. What does that bring it down to? So that brings it down to 1299 now, which in my opinion is a pretty great price. When it went up to 1499, it was like great bike, eh, medium price, but now right. it's back in that, like, you know, two thumbs up, go grab one kind of pricing. Right, and and that's the upgraded version with the um, what 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 are the upgrades on that one? Um, so the well, that's the the base Rad Runner, the Rad uh, -huh. uh Rad Rover Plus, the upgraded one. Uh, that's also two hundred dollars down. So now it's down to I think seventeen ninety nine, and that's the one okay. that has the hydraulic disc brakes. It's got the dual displays, the new battery that's uh, like half integrated into the frame. Gotcha. Um, yeah, all sorts of things like a newly designed frame. That's like the big upgraded one. Um, here's a question uh, we get quite a bit, and it, it's actually something we talk about a little bit. Where, so are bicycle lights optional on all e-bikes, or is that a standard? Um, so, you know, I think you agree with me when I say that um, we think that they should be integrated on all bikes. Um, you know, obviously, if you're going off road and only going, you know during the daytime you don't need them but like for, from a safety perspective it's almost like it's worth the extra work just to have the electric lights how do you feel about that yeah definitely i mean i i think that it's a safety uh piece of safety equipment and that they should be included on all e-bikes a lot of companies will make them an optional accessory because it's easy money and there's a lot of profit in add-on accessories in the e-bike right. market and that i think is unfortunate there's some e-bike models that just don't come with them and don't have an option for them, which blows my mind, especially when you're already carrying around a high capacity battery between your knees. It just R makes sense. Right. And usually the controllers have, you know, out of the box, have the outputs for battery. So it's really kind of, it's not a lot of extra work to, you know, have a base model light on and, you know, front and back. It's nice to have exactly. brake lights and all that extra too, though. Um, yeah. All right. So going here, let's see. We're talking about the uh, bit big tricks or bike tricks here. You can't shift that heavy chain, which is true, unless you have an internal gear motor. Uh, it's kind of like a belt drive, and a thin one cannot handle the force. I think that's in response to my question of like, why have two two chains? Yeah, definitely. I mean, it's it's the added expense, but you know, I mean, he's kind of nailed it there. Yeah, it gives you the shifting while not destroying it. And then. Um, as I guess a follow up, um, he asked carbon or Gregory Mann says carbon chain for an electric motor. I mean, that's so be like, like high carbon steel, maybe. Is that the idea? Or is it aren't aren't um, belt drives considered carbon 
chains. I don't know. So, uh, well, Gates says they're, I mean, they're carbon fiber reinforced belt on the chain. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, I assume they're made from some like, you know, highly corrosion resistant steel. You could do high carbon steel, but I think it rusts like crazy. Right. All right. And then one more on that, uh, would have needed something pretty chunky. If one chain belt, the offset would have been huge and more of an engineering issue cost. Yeah, that's probably true. Yeah. Agreed. All right. Here's something near and dear to my heart. Uh, paraglider option. Do we, do we have any electric paraglider things out there right now? I've seen DIY electric paragliders, which is pretty awesome because you don't have the like huge gas engine that's vibrating you to strap on your back. There. Yeah. yeah. Um, but I'm not familiar with any like retail electric paraglider options. <laughs> yeah. There's no Kmart, uh, you know, like bike aisle <laughs> paragliders. Uh, electric yeah. or gas at this point. Um, so I think that's it's probably a DIY situation at this point. Yeah. Um, I, the one nice thing about the electric paragliders that I've seen as well is that they have two motors that are kind of on the side rather than the one big, you know, uh, fuel belching thing in the middle. <laughs> and I think that's probably more efficient. Would that help you, know, you steer too? I've never flown a paraglider, so I don't know. Like, I think steering is like cable done, but yeah, I don't know. I, I think it's probably cables as well. Yeah. Um, all right. I think that's the last of the coherent stuff. And um, I think one one last thing is twenty by three better than twenty by four. Is that uh, uh, tires? No oh, tires. Yeah. Um. So personally, I think 20 by three, three inch wide, uh, 20 inch tires is like the sweet spot. There are a few bikes that have moved in that direction. The Rad Runner is like 3.3 .3 inch. So it's pretty close, I think. And uh, the electric XP 2.0 also dropped from four inch to three inch tires. And to me, that's like just a nice balance. It's not as heavy. It's not as much, you know, inertia going around that wheel, but it's still got a lot of air volume. You got a lot of cushion under you. And so I, I see it as a nice balance. A lot of people like those four inch tires because it's just so thick, so much air volume, but the three inch sort of balances that out in my opinion. Cool. All right. So that's it. Uh, why don't you take us out? Awesome. So uh, yeah, thanks for tuning in everybody. We will be back in two weeks as we do this fortnightly podcast with the next latest e-bike and other e-mobility stories. So we'll see you in a fortnight.